Woman of the Year, Lois Gibbs Environmental Lifetime Award, and on and on. And to me, Diane really embodies what I imagine Frederick Douglass must have been thinking when he said, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. So he said that those who profess to favor freedom and yet depreciate agitation are men who want crops without plowing the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the roar of its many waters. Diane is very much an unreasonable woman, and she's really willing to do whatever it takes to protect our planet. With that, please help me welcome Diane Wilson to the podium. Howdy, all of y'all. Uh, it's real good to be here. Uh, I'm from that other country down south, y'all, uh, and no, it's not Mexico, it's Texas. And uh, I, I know uh, you may not realize sometimes uh, Texas kind of moves up in your neck of the woods. Uh, matter of fact, not too long ago, governor of the state of Texas was, was in Vermont because there was a uh, uh, conference on secession in Texas is real big on secession and and actually they they believe they're still an independent uh, country and matter of fact the Texas flag flies higher and more often than the US flag down there so I come from a uh, a strange country down there, and uh, and and I also happen to be a shrimper. I'm a fourth generation uh, fisherwoman, and uh, uh, that's another uh, strange bag to be carrying around. I know uh, up in this neck of the woods, I probably most of y'all know about fishermen. I don't know if y'all know about fishwomen. Uh, we're just a little bit more honorary than the fishermen. But uh, I know one time I was up in. Uh, uh, DuPont's headquarters, and it was in Delaware, and uh, I was doing a hunger strike against DuPont, and, uh, you know, when, when, when you do an action, and, and this is part of being unreasonable, is that you get as close to their faces as you can get, and so I, I went a, right across from DuPont's headquarters, like that was DuPont, they had their little windows open, they could see me, and I was across the street sitting in a little chair, and uh, it took about three days before the uh, newspaper finally come down and did a uh, story, and, uh, and the headlines said, uh, Shrimper on a hunger strike. And uh, there was such little knowledge of shrimpers that the next day I had a carload of guys come by, and they said, where's that stripper on the hunger strike? <laughs> So I often get confused for the stripper. But uh, anyway, I, I, I wanted to tell you that I am basically, believe it or not, uh, I've got a real reputation these days as a hell raiser. Uh, I think people uh, think that I am a really a rambunctious, outspoken, hell raising type of person. But actually, I'm extremely shy. I... Uh, I'm a wallflower, and I, uh, I, I really, really don't like talking. But, uh, but I have uh, since got over that little quirk there. But uh, I, I know when I, when I was very little, I, I started uh, shrimping when I was eight years old. Uh, a lot of families do that. And, um, and I just happened to be one of the women who loved it so much. And probably because, one, I was a little bit of a mystic. And so when I could go into the bay, I could actually see the bay as a woman, you know. And I, I think that's where it's real important because we, we talk about Gaia all the time. We talk about environmental consciousness. We talk about deep ecology. And we're talking about a living spirit. And when I was young, I could see it. You know, you, you hear Native Americans talk about their grandfather the tree, or father the sky, or mother the sea, and it's like, it is true. It is true. It is alive, and probably that is one reason why it's so easily for me to get so passionate about what I was doing because it is alive. It is not theory. It come gut level, and so I often thought without my head a lot of times. But, but uh, predominantly, uh, so I, I come from this very small fishing village. Uh, it's so tiny, 
Bonnie and Clyde used to hide out there. Now, y'all, y'all know Bonnie and Clyde? Where they literally hid out in our little fishing village. And matter of fact, my great uncle used to take Bonnie, who was holding a pet rabbit, take her up the river because supposedly her mother was living up there in a cabin. So anyway, so it's very tiny, very tiny. And you would think something this tiny, this rural, would have nothing to do with any controversy. But uh, it actually happened when I was 40 years old. And it was the first time the toxic release inventory. How many has heard of that one? The TRI data? My tiny county, uh, probably... 15,000 people in the entire county. We were the number one toxic polluter in the entire nation. We had half the waste generated in the dear old state of Texas in my county. And, uh, you know, and, and I'm, uh, like I said, I'm extremely shy, very quiet. I love the bay, had no deckhand because I couldn't stand the talk of a deckhand. So, So when I got that information, I did something I had never did before. And sometimes being unreasonable, sometimes stepping out, it takes something as tiny as picking up a phone. Because I didn't call people on the phone. I especially didn't call meetings. And so I took that one piece of information. And, And if I have learned one thing is, is that... In your lifetime, and I'm sure a lot of you have already found out this fact, is in your lifetime, you can get one piece of paper, and what you do with that information will determine the rest of your life. And I guarantee you, all I did was read a little Associated Press story, pick up a phone, and call City Hall in downtown Cedar Rapids, population 1,000, and within two days... I had the bank president, I had chamber of commerce, I had the mayor, I had the plant manager, I had the senator sent his aide down there, and they're like, what are you trying to do, Diane? Are you trying to start a vigilante group? And it blew my mind. I could not figure out what was going on. You know, that's how ignorant I was. I was so ignorant, I didn't know where the head of the EPA was at. He was in Dallas, I didn't know that. I didn't know the name of the chemical plants around there. We had about six of them. I had no idea what their names were, what they were putting out. I didn't know where the state environmental agencies were. I I was probably, I I bet you, I can put my ignorance up against any one of y'all down there. (laughs) I guarantee I did. And and, and the thing of it is, is I, I found out real fast is that Especially, it was especially in Texas, and I hope to God it's not as bad for y'all here because I, I learned a very valuable lesson is that when you're in the state of Texas or a place equivalent, kind of like Louisiana or probably Mississippi, someplace like that, is that you will find out every typical standard step you take is blocked because Everybody in my entire county, every politician had received a contract from the company I was fighting. Every, a matter of fact, the head of the EPA was the campaign manager of a politician in Texas who was running for the president of the United States. So there was not one single question asked. There was not one politician on board. The people were so afraid. And, and you know, because down there, the fisheries are dying. We, we were in a crisis. We had the largest dolphin die off in the whole mammal stranding networks. There were dead dolphins all over our bays. No questions, no questions. And so if you're one person who asks questions is, you know, you, 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 will, you will get a backlash like you cannot believe, you know. And, and first of all, they, they were saying that uh, I was a woman with no education, so therefore they really didn't even think I was behind what I was behind. Obviously, somebody else was doing it. They were saying that the state of Louisiana had hired me as a spy to derail everything in Texas so it could go to Louisiana. 
That's how bad they were thinking because they just cannot believe that people mean what they say, that they care about their health, they care about the base, they cannot believe it. You know, they're like, what do you really want? Is it a job do you want? You know, I can't believe all the, the workers that would come up to me and say, are you trying to get a new truck? What is it you want? You know, and, and, and so what, what it boils down, especially when you're high school educated, and, and I did, I did hate chemistry. You know, so, so I had no expertise on anything. I had no one on my side. None of the newspapers were covering anything. But the only thing, and, and this is where you people will relate, the only thing you cared about was your plot of earth, your bay, your river, your mountain, your whatever. And... And so it, it comes to a point, it's like, do you be real reasonable and just see the writing on the wall? Because I had a lot of people say, read the writing on the wall, Diane. You're at the very end of a bad, very bad parade. You know, and I was. I was at the tail end of it. And it's like, pat yourself on the back. Don't feel bad. Just know it's done deal. Just give it up. And it's like, the only thing I had going for me was my passion for that bay. And I'm like, I am not giving up that bay. And they're like, well, it's a done deal. There's nothing you can do. And I'm like, I mean, this is where it sometimes helps to not think so much. Don't think so much. Don't try to plan it out so much. I mean, for once, fill your gut instinct. And that's what I did. I mean, off the top of my head, I like, I'm going to do a hunger strike, you know. I would never did a hunger strike, didn't know about a hunger strike, hadn't read Gandhi, hadn't read Mitch Schneider. I, di I didn't know nothing about it except you did not eat. That was the only thing I knew. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and, and this, is, this is where it really helps to be ignorant. It really, really does. I am so glad sometimes I am not well educated. It's because I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to do a hunger strike. And they're like, people in Texas don't do hunger strikes. <laughs> We, you know, they really don't. They don't do hunger strikes. You know, they take a gun and shoot out something, but they certainly don't, don't do hunger strikes. And I'm like, no, I'm going to do a hunger strike. I'm, I'm going to do one. And, and, the, and the thing was, I was so ignorant about a hunger strike that I did my first hunger strike on a shrimp boat in the bay without a cell phone. And number one is if you're going to do a hunger strike, you want people to know where you're at and what you're doing. And the only people who knew I was on the hunger strike was the chemical plant. And they would come down there uh, at least two or three times. And they would bring all their corporate people with their suit and ties and their shiny black shoes. And they, I remember one time there were seven guys. And they just lined up in front of me. And I was sitting on the deck. And there, they, this one guy said, now, don't she look stupid? Just look at her. She, everybody in town is just talking about how stupid you look. And it's like, oh, please, please, please get off this hunger strike. And, and the thing of it is, this is what is amazing about stepping on the edge, putting something at risk. I totally believe, I sincerely believe that it is a key to the universe and you can create change. Because when I put myself out there, it's like, it was like, and, and, and you know, and even Gandhi, Gandhi calls it, it's like, it's this energy from your heart. And it's a different type of energy. It's not a visceral, it's not a cerebral energy. It's a different type of energy. And it's like companies cannot control it. They cannot predict you. And things are suddenly off their axis. And I remember that the very first hunger strike I did, and, and I have did 10 of them. I have, the very first one, I, it only took me two weeks to accomplish exactly what I wanted. And it, it was another instance where it blew my mind. It's, and that's where I learned the valuable lesson about putting things at risk. 